family members of those bereaved uh, by the conflict in Israel and Palestine are to lead a vigil for all of those suffering in the conflict in central London on Sunday, December the 3rd. Uh, now, the widow of Joe Cox, a Labour MP who was murdered by a far-right extremist during the referendum, understands better than most the toxicity of hate and the importance of building bridges and coming together against violence. So, Brendan Cox, the co-founder of the Together Coalition, joins us in the studio. Lovely to see you, Brendan. Morning. Thank you so much for coming in. So, tell us what has led to you wanting to host this at the weekend. As we, as we just said there in our introduction, nobody understands uh, better than you do the consequences of when that kind of ideology of hate, the volume raises on it and raises on it. Is that what's led you to this point now, this vigil this weekend? Yeah, I mean, I think it came from this upsurge amongst people, which is that the vast majority of the debate is dominated by the loudest, most extreme voices. And in fact, the vast majority of the public in the UK have real concern for a civilian, uh, an innocent civilian who is Israeli, who has been killed, and has got the same concern for an innocent civilian who is Palestinian, um, who has been killed. And what we're being told time and time again is you have to take a side. There's only one side and the other side is all evil. And in those moments, I guess my concern about it was you whip up this anger, you whip up this hatred. Extremists piggyback on it. They decide actually this is the fault of all Jews or all Muslims. And in that context, we know and I know from my experience that extremists can do incredibly extreme things. And I'm very worried about the community co cohesion in the UK. So what it's designed to do, what this day is designed to do, is to give voice to the vast majority of the public who feel the grief, whether they are Palestinian and Israeli, have no time for anti-Semitism, mm. have no time for anti-Muslim hatred, and want to protect our communities in the UK. We don't need to import the conflict from Israel-Palestine into the UK. And so this is led by families who have lost people in Palestine, led by people who have lost people in Israel, saying, if we can come together, if we can bury our differences and say there can be no room for hate on our streets, mm. then we should all be able to do that as well. It's a very radical approach, actually, because we've seen in London over uh, the last several weekends, we have these very separate protests. You have the mm. Palestinian protests, where the mood could be described, I think, a, uh, accurately, is a little bit more angry. There have been a few more arrests at the Palestinian uh, marches. Um, and we had the Israeli march at the weekend, which was very peaceful, which ended in a spontaneous, uh, you know, God save the Queen at the end of it. So they have quite a different different energy. Two very, very difficult groups of people to bring together, Brendan. Yes, although I think the vast majority of people, um, uh, as I say, feel that same sentiment, feel that togetherness in, in the face of it. And I understand, I understand why people uh, are incredibly angry seeing the pictures on the TV screen, seeing your social media feeds. Mm -hmm. If you mostly follow accounts that might be Israeli, for example, the hostages, the pain of that, the massacre um, uh, by the terrorists on the 7th of October. If you mostly follow Palestinian accounts, the children who are being killed in the rubble, the anger is understandable. I think what we're trying to do is to say that you can feel that anger, you can feel that frustration, but you don't have to turn that into hatred. You don't have to decide that the other side is evil. You don't have to decide that you hate all Muslims, all Jews. And the vast majority of people don't do that. The vast majority of people feel that empathy and feel that concern. And I think it's something that we can all do something about. I think too often in these moments, extremists piggyback on the grief of people who are suffering, whether they are Israeli or whether they are Palestinians, and try to change that grief into anger and then anger into extremism. And the incredible leadership of the families who are putting together this vigil are saying, enough is enough, not in our name. It'd be really interesting, if, Brendan, wouldn't it too, if there was all party political mm. support for this. I know this is about there is. family. There is. Well, that's yes. what I was going to ask you about that. Uh, so would, you'll see some senior politicians from all sides at the march? Yes, I very much hope so. Uh, when we put this together, uh, we had Conservative, Labour, Liberal Democrats, MPs all speaking at the beginning of it. I think this is something that cuts across political yeah. parties. And the reality is we can all have very different views about what should happen next, what you prioritise, how you reach peace in the Middle East. It's not a simple thing that can be sloganised. But even in the midst of that, we can disagree well. We can have those conversations. We can have those debates. We can be angry with each other. But that doesn't mean that anger needs to turn mm. to hatred. And it doesn't mean we need to dehumanise each other. What did you make of Suella Bravman's comments about the fact that the police... Um, operate differently than Metropolitan Police with far-right protesters and those who maybe are, are, are more sort of left-wing or in this situation, specifically the Palestinian protesters. Did she have a point? 
I'm not an expert in policing. Um, I think it's really important that the police are equal in their approach and that when they see uh, extremism and when they see terrorism or when they see incitement to, to violence, they act. I know that in some cases, for operational reasons, they do that after the event rather than in the event because of uh, crowd control, for example. But one of the things I've been saying is that whenever um, marches like this happen, the organisers have a responsibility to tackle that extremism because there's always a lunatic fringe that mm. attaches themselves to Brexit or to Remain or to Palestine or to Israel. And what the organisers need to do and what all good people who are part of those causes need to do is to distance themselves from that. So I've seen, for example, I had a lot of friends who were on the Palestinian marches who were outraged that there were people who were supporting Hamas on them because yeah. they are just humanitarians who want yeah. the bombing to mm. stop. And I know that there are Israeli, um, uh, sorry, Jewish uh, people in this country on that march who really took a strong line against Tommy Robinson, mm. for example, trying yeah. to hijack that. So I think we all have a responsibility. But what we're doing on Sunday at three o'clock at Downing Street is asking people not to bling flags, not to bling placards, but to bring themselves. And not masks, maybe. And not masks as well, and to mm. be there together to share the pain of civilians, no matter what their background, what their religion, and to say, not just in Israel-Palestine, but even more importantly in the UK, we can, as very different people who might fundamentally disagree about what should happen next, we can live together peacefully. And if we don't do that, mm. then the hope of that ever happening in Israel-Palestine is it's very It's a real kind of indication, it's a real manifestation, actually, of, of Joe Cox's legacy, of, of Joe's legacy, that she was very much about bringing people together, wasn't she? And her famous phrase about people having more in common. How, how hard is that for you, on, on a personal level, to keep Joe's memory alive and to, to keep putting all of your energies into this sort of activity? Joe and I worked on this kind of stuff before. We worked together when we met. Um, uh, we were working on conflicts around the world. We worked on Israel-Palestine together, in fact. Uh, we worked on the Lebanon together. We worked on countries around the world. And, and in all of that, as you say, what, what Joe did was to try not to sort of, you know, say on this side, on that side, but actually to try to find those areas where people can agree, where people can have that commonality. And that's not glib. In fact, it's, it's one of the hardest things to do. One of the easiest things to do is to believe a simplistic narrative that the other side is completely mm. wrong and you are completely right. But actually to see that nuance and to find those areas where people can come together, I think that's where the vast majority of the British public mm. are. They're very sensible, very pragmatic. They're not extreme, but sometimes too often their voices are drowned out. She'd be at the front of the march, I'm pretty sure, with you, Brendan, on she Sunday does. for sure. But can I ask you too, some MPs, including Joe's own sister, yeah. have had their offices and even their homes targeted by, it doesn't matter which side of the extreme they are, but extremes on both sides. What do you say about that? I think that people who uh, move from... Um, anger around a cause and protesting around a cause to intimidation and to violence uh, need to be addressed by the police. But what they also do is they undermine their cause um, because what they do is they drive politicians away from engaging with them. They won't listen to those voices. So I think it's counterproductive. I also think in public eyes, it then aligns those that do that with the extremes. And mm. as I was saying, the British public mm. have no time for extremes. So I think we do need to take it seriously because it also means for the long term, mm. it undermines our democracy. If we can't have a safe place for politicians to campaign and to meet their constituents, mm. then we're in danger. Uh, that's what I was just going to say, really. Would you, you, so I think you've answered my question, which is that you wouldn't want to see greater restrictions on people being able to go to MPs houses you know in America I think there are some rules around the fact that you can't go to a, a, a politician's house and knock on the door like you can here um, but you would think that would be overreach even with your history Brendan of having lost your wife in those circumstances you still think that would be too much I think it's really important that we don't let extremists undermine our mm. democracy and part of our democracy is enabling um, uh, people to meet their mm. uh, MPs I think it's much better to do that at, at a constituency surgery. I think it's much better to do that at the public events. Um, but it, there is a risk. There absolutely is a risk that if that risk becomes too high, then MPs will withdraw from that public role that they have. And that would be a real ch shame for our democracy, I think. Yeah. What's it like, if I could ask, you've got Christmas coming up. Um, how difficult is that? Uh, I know you've made a new life now, you have a new wife, but Christmas without Joe must, be very must have been very tough for years for you and your kids. Yeah, it was. I mean, in fact, um, we've just been um, uh, going through old Christmas videos ah. um, 
uh, of Joe with the kids at their various stages, mm. uh, singing various uh, Christmas songs. And they were um, three and five when you lost Joe. Yeah, they were three. Mm. And, they were three and five. Um, but I think that you know, I'm very lucky. My kids are incredibly resilient and um, incredibly still full of Joe's love and her empathy and. They're certainly the thing that has kept me going ever since uh, ever since she uh, she was killed, but also I think that signal of hope. So they don't have a sort of shred of hate in them. They don't uh, harbour a sort of deep and underlying resentment. They treat people as they come, and they I think are uh, and 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 this Christmas we'll just be looking forward as all kids will be to what's in you know, oh, the what comes down the what comes down the the, the chimney. Okay. Can I just ask you about because it's obviously. With, there are people, there'll be people watching this who, who feel disillusioned with their life at the moment. Maybe people who were born here, who see that there were 750,000 net migration last year, who feel that their life is not what it should be and that people arrive here and they get given a house and they get given benefits and they get put in a hotel. And that's where some of that resentment and that anger comes from. What would you say to those people? I think people who are angry about the status quo, and I think lots of people are, are in many cases right to be so. I think there's lots of things to be furious about in our country, from homelessness to poverty to inequality to um, injustice. Um, so I, I think it is totally understandable. The question is how you channel that and what do you do about it? And it is completely legitimate to campaign for change, to campaign in, in the example that you were, you were giving to bring down the, mm -hmm. the figures on immigration, to change the way that uh, migrants are um, assimilated into society. You can campaign for that. It's completely legitimate. What isn't legitimate is to drive hatred against those individuals and to blame whole groups of people for the actions of minorities or for the perceptions of actions of minorities. And as long as we hold that line, I think we can have an incredibly vibrant democracy mm. where people can be passionate, people can actively disagree, where they can want to change the government and want it to have a radical different policy, but still respect each other's humanity. And that is what the vast majority of the UK public do. Isn't part of the problem, of course, that politics and democracy is dependent on people being divided because we have a Conservative Party that's asking people to think one way and you will have a Labour Party asking the public to think another way and, and pitching for that vote on the very basis of the fact that they have to say we are different to that how do we square that in this conversation yeah i mean i, th I think that that's a that's a big question it might be above mm. my, my pay grade <laughs> but but i think that the the way that our political system works actually in some ways can be quite positive because you tend to win politics from the middle in the mm. uk so when the labor party went off to the far left under jeremy corbyn it became unelectable. When mm. the Conservative Party has been off to the far right, it has been unelectable. Mm. And therefore, the way our political system works is you have to create those coalitions in the middle and aim for that voter in the middle. And I think what that tends to do is it means we don't sway from one extreme to the other. And I think that's, that's a positive thing. But lots of this isn't about politics. It's about us. It's about what we all do. It's about what your viewers do. And I think one of the most powerful things from this, when we're thinking about the current context, for example, there's, there's two ways that you can respond to this stuff. One is to try and um, pour f petrol on the, on the flames, to say that your side is always right and the other mm. side is always evil. Um, the most powerful thing that I see on social media in particular is when somebody might agree with the cause, they might be a hardcore Brexiteer, um, but they might challenge somebody when their language goes too far and starts to spread racism. Somebody might be a um, hardcore Remainer, mm. but another Remainer challenged them when they call all Brexiteers racist. So it's that, that, that stuff within our communities, if we all challenge that, if we all enforce good behaviour, that's the thing that will have a real impact on how our politics wouldn't plays out. It, and wouldn't it help, Brendan, if the big media giants, Facebook and the like, cleaned up social media? Because it is a cesspit, frankly. And it promotes and spreads hate. A hundred percent. And not just that, it's, it, I think one of the problems uh, that we often have here is that there are uh, media organisations that not only, in social media organisations, that not only say that they are um, uh, a platform, yes. but they actively propagate the most extreme mm. views. Mm, if you look at the way that the algorithm works, yeah. it promotes the most extreme mm. content. If you go onto uh, Twitter now, for example, the most extreme, if you put in Israel-Palestine, it will be the most extreme voices because they're the ones that get the engagement, they're the ones that get the clicks. And as long as we have that, um, it's dangerous because it drives people, it drives the conversation to extremes. Now, having said that, again, 
the vast majority of the British public are incredibly sensible and yeah. they see those extremes and they don't like them or and they withdraw it. from it. Mm. And yeah. you see the vast majority of the posts on someone mm. like Twitter are from people that represent a tiny minority of, of mm. the views. We just need to, as this vigil will, I hope, on Sunday at three mm. o'clock outside Downing Street, I hope moments like that will provide an opportunity for the mainstream voices to come to the mm. floor. I hope okay. you get a huge turnout, Brendan. Thank it's, you very much. You deserve to. It's great to see you. Really and great. we will put the details of the vigil on the GB News website as well so people want to go and get the details. Thank you.